La Lanterna, a spotlight in Italian football, is a podcast that dives into the beautiful game seen from the eyes of two fans from the oldest team in Italy's point of view. My name is Fabrizio Cardone, Canadian and Genovese, together with my friend Matt Killen, an American-born and Genoa fan. Every week, we'll tell you all you need to know about the only team you need to know about, Genoa CFC. Plus, we'll have guests and provide updates from around the magical world of Italian football. Benvenuti, welcome to La Lanterna Podcast. This is Fabrizio with my best buddy. Matt, what's up? Babari, how are you feeling? I, that's, uh, you could hear from my tone that was a little bit off because peeved, angry, upset, All the disappoint- above. disappointed, no. I have to say at least we're, I'm not disappointed at all. Well, disappointed with the outcome, but yeah. anyways, we're talking about match day 27. It was at the San Siro Inter versus Genoa. Uh, we had quite an interesting, especially for, if you look at it from, obviously from an Inter perspective, but if you look at it for also from a neutral perspective, I would ex- assume that it was freaking exciting match. I'd say so, although the guys in the U.S. were doing their hardest to try to tell you it was a boring, one-sided, interdominant performance until it wasn't. I have such a problem with that stuff. The bias. For anyone listening overseas and concerned or upset about media bias not favoring Genoa or any team that's not in Milan or wherever, rest assured it also exists in North America. But it was a fantastic match if you actually watched it and if you'd have the persuasion to, to have seen this, this performance. But to your point, tough one, because we didn't get what we deserved. And it seems like it's a repeat story for us. We're, we're getting screwed out of points here, I feel like. Let me wrap back to what you just said. I do not watch it through your North American streams. If I'm not mistaken, actually, you tell me, is it Paramount Plus? In the US, yeah, we have Paramount right. Plus. We don't have Paramount Plus, and I don't think, I'm almost positive on what I'm about to say, but I don't think that the audio stream internationally or the English international stream, neither, definitely does not take it from Paramount+. Plus. Specifically, I'm not sure if he's part of this, but it makes me understand of what that is all about. And I'm, I'm just going to say it bluntly. I have it a little bit out there against this, want to call it, journalist. His name is Matteo Bonetti. I know he's from Paramount Plus or Fox or one of those ones. Anyways, he's from the States. He's just your typical only looking for clicks and only talking about the major teams as if anybody else is just there to give the points to the big ones. And I dislike that type of journalism and I dislike that type of uh, of uh, commentatorship. Yeah, Matteo Benetti is one of the guys in, in the press room for Paramount Plus. And it's just, look, I actually think the guys calling the match themselves were decent I, I, I didn't find sometimes they can be a little bit annoying or whatever and it just was it was for me frustrating because you you get into halftime and it's like well genoa who are in a relegation battle and it's like dude all you have to no. do is look at the fucking table like you don't even have to watch the games just you're getting paid whatever money you're getting paid to go on television and talk about soccer all day it's an awesome job just look at the fucking table. And it was just so clear. Like the they showed the clip of Goodmanson's failed cross and like, oh, well, this is what you can't do if you're Genoa. You can't be, this is a team that's just waiting to pounce and enter and you're just making mistake after mistake. It's like, fuck off. Like, have you guys been watching these guys all season? Like, okay, he had a shitty corner. Have you seen half of the shit that this Inter team have done this match? And then, you know, at least everyone in the U.S., was clear-headed in, in how they were talking about the penalty, which I think we'll have to get to pretty quickly. And there was obviously some comments. I think you shared earlier today that the referees like no longer working matches for a while. Like, dude, what the fuck? Can we get a can we get a fucking break? Enough with these apologies. I mean, at least this time we're actually getting an apology. I don't think we got it against Milan that time it happened, or the time we got fucked out of it the last time we played Inter. So, uh, whatever. We're I'll let you decide if you want to talk about this now or later. <laughs> well, we can do anything. So the match ends, obviously, too. No, there's no obvious, but there's actually, there is actually absolutely no obvious thing here. But the match ends 2-1 for Inter. 
And it was, as I, we said before, it was a super entertaining match. It started very strong hold for Genoa. Inter seemed for the first 20 minutes really to suffer, if, you, if I may add to that. Actually, to the point that a lot of Inter fans after the match, which, if you remember, I did say uh, to our, one of our past guests that out of all the big ones, Inter fans seem to be a little bit more mild or less... Um, I'm going to try to be a little bit, you know, censored here, but uh, less um, badly, obviously, and blunt towards their team. I still believe that compared to the other ones. Obviously, you will always find fans that are still going to be rooting and be blind about their own team. At the same time, I think that Inter did suffer and a lot of fans were actually, that's where I was going to go with all this, to say that a lot of fans were vivaciously saying on, on, on social media throughout, what's wrong with Genoa? What I want them a, a doping measures to see what they have in their blood because it's impossible to run so much for 95 minutes. And, and to your point, it's like you've never watched the Jura match anyways. So that, that's that's the obvious reason including the first leg, because right. even though that tie goal that we started, we scored first and then they tied because the push and it helped a little bit and that was a mistake also in the first leg, if you were watching Interista that match, Interista and I'm more leaning towards looking at those people that think, well, what's wrong with Genoa? They can't run so much. They're all on drugs or stuff like that. Well, that's what we always do, and that's what Genoa is all about. And to your point, it's like, if you watch, if you had ever watched any other match uh, for Genoa, that's normal. I don't know, man. I, I just, like, it's it's frustrating enough that you don't always get, it's, it's hard to find outlets. I think it's a big reason why this pod exists and why we're doing this all the time is because there's not a lot of English content out there for fans who care about Calcio, who maybe don't want to root for Juve or for Napoli or for Inter or whomever. And, you know, you and I'm sorry, that. again, shout out to our friends from Atalanta, to our friends from Torino, to all those pods out there that are not yes. the typical 653 big sisters, because that's what the culture is all about. It's not only about the big ones. And actually, I'm, I'm quite surprised and pleased at the same time. And there's three testate, we call it Italian. The three news, uh, sports newspapers that are officially the national ones. Uh, and I'm doing this quote unquote because they're not really national, all of them anyways. And they've always been super biased. So the first one, and this is no rank of importance, obviously, because the most important, just because of how many newspapers are sold every every day, mm -hmm. is, is La Gazzetta dello Sport. So that's the pink one. Yeah. And that's the one I'm going to get at in a second. Then you have Tutto Sport, which to me is like the least national one because it's a pro Juve 90% and 10% Torino because it's Torino based, Torino City. Right. And then you have... Yeah. Gazzetta dello Sport, which is probably on rank the third most important, but it's almost like your, I don't know, gossip almost, but you know, in a way how it's considered. So going back to La Gazzetta dello Sport, surprisingly, like if you look at the higher level of title, it's like you've, um, sorry, Inter, closer to the Scudetto, great win, blah, 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 right? But then if you read better into it, it's Inter suffered, Inter almost didn't make it. Genoa did. You have a good pal right beside you. Look at that. That's so, so you guys can't see it, but Matt's dog is right. He's on a couch and his dog just went on the shoulders of the I have to share this because it's a very beautiful picture. And he went on the top of the shoulder of, of the couch and it just went there, looked at him, laid down, and it put his his uh, his uh, head right on his shoulders. Beautiful. Anyways, going back to what I was saying is uh, the Gazzetta dello Sport and it was finally talked about a Genoa that almost gave a tough moment to Inter was the one that maybe they were spoiled on the four now things and so on. They thought they were going to have another walk in the park and they didn't. I mean, at least we're getting some some publication in a positive way that way. And to be fair, I've been I've been somewhat surprised. I remember, I think we 
I mentioned probably like three or four weeks ago, there was uh, on their social media, uh, every now and then they'll have something Genoa related on, on Gazetta's Instagram pages and things like that. And they had that one graphic of Goodmanson playing in Porto Antico and, you know, the comments about his foot falling off because it's in the water and stuff like that and all that. But like, at least there's some spotlighting that's happening that that is kind of calling back to what's going on with the team. But yeah, you, you just hope that we get a little bit more positive pub in here. Because look, it's always going to be this dynamic. We're not going to be expected to beat Inter ever. If we were in the fourth position and Inter were in the first position, maybe the match has a different frame to it. Maybe people are saying, wow, this is a battle between two Champions League place clubs, but Inter is still going to be expected to beat us. And so that's always going to be part of the narrative. But at the same time, you just hope that there are people who are giving you that analysis that actually are doing their homework and actually can have a conversation and aren't just kind of writing off of whatever they read on ESPN app the other day of what happened or something. So that's my soapbox on the whole coverage. I agree with you. Like, I get it. It's not that I don't get it. So when I'm just saying these yeah. things. No, I, I think we're saying a similar Yeah, thing. I, I do understand it. You you still want to give that narrative to to like as you, the word, I mean, I'm using your word, but essentially to, to target those people that are your listeners, your, most of your listeners and so on. But also you you are expecting if you're called a journalist, if you want to be called a fair journalist and so on, you have to be, as we say in Italian, super partes, like no on no one's side. And that's what I expect. Otherwise, you're not a journalist, you're a fan. It's a different thing. Yeah, very different. And, and I do get that if you do talk more about Inter compared to Genoa, you will have more people following you versus not. But you can also do it in a different way, I, I suppose. Again, we're fans and we're biased and we're seeing it from the other perspective. One of our future guests is an Inter fan and a journalist, and maybe he can tell us a little bit more about it. But at the same time, we do, Rich, Richard, by the way, uh, at the same time, let's talk about this match. So first 20 minutes, if I may add it here, as I mentioned before, I think that it was all about Genoa. Unfortunately, an early yellow card for Martin Frandrup. He was probably, out of all of our players, the one that felt most of this match. I don't know why but a little bit more nervous or perhaps maybe, and we'll get to it, of the indec indecency of the referee. But around the 30th minute, then Inter scores. This one, I don't know if we can have that many complaints on. I think we got we to gotta give a little bit of props where props are due, too. We've had a couple of guests recently call some of the shots lately. Aslani with the goal, who obviously has been looking for playing time, looking to kind of break in. I think we've got to, to throw it back to Alex Donno, who had called this in the in the pod we had previewing the match about maybe Aslani getting a goal. So it was you know really quick play from Inter, really slick movement and and almost like in a counterattacking style and and super strong too, right? Yeah. So it, it 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 was a great goal and it was kind of tough because it felt like exactly like. Okay, well, it's zero zero. We, we've we've made our way in the match fairly well so far. You know, nothing really u uber concerning. But then they get that goal, and it always becomes, all right. You know, we've not made it quite to halftime yet, and we're already down one nothing. What does this mean? Does this mean like we start getting already kind of overly aggressive, and then we expose ourselves more often? What happened? And then I, you know, not very long after, I think only a few minutes afterwards is when we see the controversial penalty call, which really, I actually don't think it's right. So I know you and I are having a little bit of a debate on this, of like what it means for the match to have the penalty called or not. Obviously, it's a negative in Genoa's favor. But I think kind of an interesting frame of reference, the actual style of play And our actual approach to the game, obviously, you're down two goals. Maybe that does change versus being down one goal. Genoa continued the entire rest of the match, putting on pressure, looking for chances, trying to create opportunities. And so, like, I don't think it's entirely correct to say it changed the match in the sense that, like, Genoa continued. And you even heard, I, I know I'm kind of glossing over the moment because in some ways I kind of want to because it was just so egregiously bad. But, like, at halftime... 
I don't know if you caught this on the broadcast that you were watching, but they had a, a camera on like the tunnel where the players were coming out on the Paramount Plus broadcast. And you you could hear Rutegi uh, encouraging the team saying, it's zero, 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 zero this half. It's an even half. It's zero, zero. Let's go. Let's, let's, let's start this fresh, basically. And it was like, I mean, obviously he was saying it in Italian, but it was like, oh shit. Like, it was just cool because it seemed like everybody was on that wavelength. They were on the same mindset of, you know, we need to still take the game by the scruff of the neck. And it wasn't a defeated Genoa. It wasn't a Genoa that were making complaints and saying things like, I can't believe they called that a penalty, which would have been honestly probably a correct feeling. But instead, they were focused on trying to get something out of the match. And they very, very nearly did, which is why it feels like such an injustice that it ends up 2-1 in the end. Let me go back to that penalty. I'm not going to say way too much because whomever is listening, I'm sure they're uh, attached to social media and they have listened, read, or, or, or watched my banter or anger about it. But um, And you, you've been mentioned at the beginning. So the one, the couple of things that... I've seen more on the Italian side and not on the English side that were shared or not spoken about is that Sky TV on their TV special at the end of the day, uh, evening anyways, when they were showing that, they showed uh, a video and that's what the video that I shared and or that it was circulating around that was not shared with the referee. Back step one second is... Uh, the action happens on the left side of the of the of the box where Barella uh, runs into the into the area, and Frendrup to his right is uh, crossing against him, crossing meaning running towards him, and tries in a sliding tackle tries to catch the ball. Indeed, he actually does, and this is the only image where it was not shared with the VAR did not share with the referee where Barella kicks the ball. Frendrup catches with the tippy toe or with his cleats the ball and then for natural events of sliding Barella when he's kind of like in his kick he's in midair sort of thing he tries to land that's when he colludes with uh, Frendrup and he and he falls this is what actually happened while from the images and from the original thought of what the referee has thought was Yes, he did kick it first. Yes, Frendrup did catch, touch Barella after Barella touched the ball. The general opinion is a dangerous tackle. And that's the purpose of, of why that very difficult call, if you say. Also because even VAR, without that image that I mentioned before, did call the referee up saying, look at these images. Are you sure about your call for a penalty? Because it doesn't seem like a clean penalty to me interpretations i didn't listen to the to the words from var here's another ball through to barella barella bearing down on cole and hits the side netting penalty however awarded by giovanni airaldi giovanni airaldi sticks with his on-field decision and confirms the penalty but the point is with the sky tv showed these images that var did not pull out if sky tv has him that means that also var has it why weren't they presented and shown to the referee? It always, what's frustrating every single time is that we have to go through these hypothetical, I mean, not hypothetical, because you're right, this is, this is something that was actually a problem. But why is it that every single match we have to d ask these questions? Why did the camera angle not be made available to the professional responsible for making a decision about the match? Why does it seem like a pretty obvious decision was, was not made correctly by a professional who is in the place to make the match. It's just, I understand sometimes that there are some challenges where, you know, referees are given a letter of the law and it's not about their personal feeling or their personal intuition as always anymore about how they should be responding to plays. It's about how they understand within the box that's been given to them, they are meant to carry out the orders that are there. And I think you, there are, and numerous bad decisions that get referenced in that type of framework because, well, there's this set of criteria that I'm being told I must follow and, and stay aligned with. But a lot of times that criteria has more gray area than maybe is explained. And then it becomes something where we're making almost like a farce of this entire process. We have video people in a video booth who are suggesting something 
but it, it just like everything about it is ridiculous. Like for this to be still given after VAR, it's like, why is VAR even around? Why would we even have a service like this if it's not correcting what is clearly a, a poor decision? You know, at this point, you may as well just not defend. As soon as that guy walks into the, the penalty box, okay, pull it, just let him run. Like, no more defending in the penalty box. That's just a defender-free zone, and everyone just gets free shots from there on. Like, that, that's where we are. Like, if you want to say that that's a dangerous tackle and that endangered the player and he should be awarded a penalty, I mean, what are we taught? What the hell are we watching? Like, what is this game anymore? Like, that's, it's very much a normal play. It's not he a dangerous not behind, play. That's the key not behind, that's to keep play. He's not making this, like, that, if, if he's a second and a half late and he's coming through the back of the player to get the ball. Matt, not even a second and a half, like maybe one tenth of a second. Hence, he still gets the ball. No, to- no. What I'm saying is, oh, if sorry. if if he were to be, if he was to have reacted that way, a second and a half late from when he actually did, okay. then maybe you could say that okay, it's a penalty because he's late to the ball, he's coming through, right. he's endangering the player, but the timing was almost immaculate in, in how he makes that play. And and you come in and you say... He actually does, because in that image, at least from what I've seen, it was quite straight in line with the ball towards the goal. So it looks like Barella is shooting that ball, kicking that ball, and that ball is going in the direction of the goal... I'm not saying that Martinez would not got, got it, but it's going in, in, in the ball in, in towards the goal and friendship with his tippy toe, as I mentioned before, deviates it enough and it goes technically it should have been corner, but it was called a penalty. Having said that, another noticed thing that has not come out, at least I noticed in the English sides, was that the president of Genoa, which is Professor Zangrillo, yeah. after the VAR decision, he has decided to leave the pitch, which he had an official comment after the match, perhaps almost a day after, apologizing for leaving earlier. But he did it, more or less his words or not, in the name of the fans and the team. And he had promised to the designator of the refereeing not to uh, comment badly about the referees. And he did also say, you know, we're we're all human. It's a very delicate, and I agree with this, it's a very delicate uh, job for a referee to be doing, especially nowadays with all these eyes and technology at hand, where sometimes errors become even more obvious while before in the past they weren't even though they were, right? So he did say that. He also commended Gilardinos and his opera and the team, and especially the fans, by saying that these fans are incredible. Moments after this, de- de- this, you know, this uh, interview or not, it was not necessarily a coincidence, but uh, as you mentioned just earlier on, the refereeing of official Uh, has deemed that the referee, Airaldi, which was the referee for Inter Genoa, is going to be banned from refereeing for quite some period of time. So that's an indirect apology. There's nothing it comes to in our hand, but at least it shows that to those people that think that that was a penalty, if that happens, that means that it was a bad call. Also because if you call it a penalty... The rule says that is a foul that caused the penalty, hence a yellow card. And that did not happen. So either you made the mistake of calling the the, the penalty, and, and after this I'm going to call stop it, but either that, or if you call it a penalty, then you should have yellow carded Frendrup, hence the second yellow, hence the red card. Well, thankfully that didn't happen. <laughs> but but yeah, it was ridiculous. So I think the thing about this entire match and what's so frustrating, and I know you and I kind of like... We were debating how much to even talk about this match because of this reason. It just overshadows and it changes the story. It doesn't necessarily change. I don't think it changed the way that the the team approached the match, which is what is so impressive and what makes you almost proud. It does make you proud as a Genuano because you look at these guys and they're at the Miazza. They're at this enormous ground that's full of people against a team that is running away with the competition right now 
in maybe for some players it's the largest ground they've played in thus far in their careers in some cases because we have some younger players on our team and they didn't back down at all they continued to go after they continued to play and you have this amazing goal from Vasquez which who I was so happy for it was just incredible Sabelli round Di Marco sits Di Marco down Bardell Martin in the middle and on the volley and it's gone in it's Vasquez the player who's played every single game this season for Genoa puts in a really good volley to make it into two. Genoa won. I told you and the guys in the group chat, I think my neighbors thought I was hurt when the goal gets scored because I started yelping out loud and screaming because I was so excited. But it's just this wonderful opportunity and this wonderful chance. We have these other chances later on. Rategi was a little bit off of his game. He had a couple of headers that weren't quite there. Spence. That's a good board. It takes his head up. Genoa coming closer and closer. We had Goodmanson was kind of flat footed on this one chance in the first half. So you have all these like moments and we're almost there. But the point of it is that the club kept their ways. They didn't say we're two nil down. We're abandoning how we approach a match. They came about it in the same manner. And it was a really, really well done match by Gilardino and by the team. And instead of having something to talk about and to say for that, we have to go and talk about why the head referee is basically saying that this referee now can no longer referee matches because he keeps making mistakes and why apparently he didn't have camera angles that other broadcasters had angles to. It's just like, what a ridiculous outcome. Like we should be talking about the guys who are playing the match, not some random person from whoever he's from, it doesn't matter, who is having this outsized impact on the match. It's just, and, and to say that we have technology that's meant to prevent this from happening, all that stuff just, I know we kind of need to put this to bed and leave it where it is, but it's just why it's so frustrating. Because as a fan, you want to see some of these guys, and we're in a unique situation perhaps, maybe not unique to most fans in, in uh, Italy and for Calcio, but some of these guys in this squad, we might not see again. You have guys coming into Genoa and, you know, in some cases we are at honest reality, a stepping stone in players' careers. These matches are so important for us as fans. It's one of the only times we have to have them grow and experience their careers with us. And when you take moments like that away, when you take a draw at the Meazza away from something that I think the team deserved to at least have that to say, you take what sort of been a win earlier in the season, you take that away, you take similar against Milan away, like these are things we're not getting back. And in some cases, we might not, you know, I'm not getting paranoid about summer transfers and stuff like that already. I just mean that like there's an increased stakes in a way for us because this, these times are few and far between in, in our fandom. And it's something that you just hope that when you see these wonderful performances and these magical moments, like how amazing would it be instead of a bunch of players coming to the side and giving applause to the, the fans who were absolutely, we've not talked about this yet, absolutely fantastic at the Miazza. That was incredible, incredible away performance, incredible audience, more than 4,000. We, we passed our allocation, just absolutely amazing. You see the players going and applauding, and, and they weren't doing so shamefully. It wasn't like one of those matches where their heads are down and they feel guilty that these fans are there giving them a show and they're not part of it. But how amazing if they really earned a point or maybe even a win at the Meazza and you see them wildly celebrating in front of the fans and to see the fans there. I know the fans stayed afterwards and sung songs for hours afterwards anyway, based off of some of the live Instagrams that you and I were probably getting. Uh, at the same time, but like that should have been the moment. That should be what we're talking about. That should be the discussion. And instead we're talking about some weirdo in a neon kit who made the wrong decision despite having video evidence to do the others otherwise. It's just like, this is ridiculous. I want to put like a stone, like, you know, put a cover on top of them and say stay yeah. out about yeah. it. But essentially yeah. Yeah. 75,000 <laughs> spectators at the San Siro, over 4,500. And that was just the the guest sector a lot of Genoese and Genoani also went because it was open for everybody on and also other stands in other sectors. So I would say somewhere close to 5,000 out of the 75,000 
sure to be honest, Inter fans uh, were in some sort of protest, but all I could see here on the television was the Genoani fans that were chanting and chanting and chanting and chanting. And this is a television, it's not media. And, and even we were getting some videos also from different individuals throughout. And and you would see uh, these this this amazing aspect of, of what we are all about. So that's one thing. Second thing is, this is the Capolista. We already knew it was going to be difficult. No question about it. This was not the match where we were to make points. I said that very clearly in the last pod. I was positive compared to you and Alex with respect to the tie. Yeah. And personally, personally, I strongly believe, even though the mathematic is not there. I know you and I talked about it just before the recording. But personally, I think that without that error from the referee, it was a highly likely match to be a tie. Yes. And and having said that, I feel I have guessed it just because of that, but um, that's just for pride. On the other note, I would say we faced the Capolista at par, at a level that they have not felt in a long time, at least maybe with some other teams, but definitely nothing else compared to one or two maybe in the entire league itself. That makes us proud of, of this amazing team that Gilardino has put together and for the likes of the amazing players that we have, regardless of them being with us the next season or not. It was, it was I mean, look, the way I think we should be looking at this match is with a lot of pride for the guys. I think they really, really played well. It was really really well done game plan it's hard to have any negatives or any people to be upset about i think you know not everybody had their perfect game but that's kind of not the point at all you know like this was a really well done performance and i think it's another credit to the team that it's another match where you know we feel hard done by because we didn't get something from the match like you said Going into this, this isn't one that seemed like, okay, we're going to just take some points. And actually, by the way, I think we have to give Alex double credit because I'm pretty sure he called the 2-1 scoreline as well at the end with, with how it finished. But it's a credit to the team. It's a credit to the, our direction that in another match like this, we're feeling pretty shitty about losing a close match away from home, by the way, against Inter, who are easily the best team in the league. I much prefer to lose against Atalanta with that 4-1 the way we played rather than losing 2-1 with that not correct call. Yeah. Having said that, let's hear what Alex has to do with his audio. I definitely feel fortunate that Inter were able to take all three points against Genoa. Inter had to suffer a lot in that match and... Genoa were certainly creating chances, uh, especially in that second half. At certain times, Inter could not keep possession, couldn't string passes together. I thought Genoa played with a lot of courage in the match. Of course, it was nice to see Inter open up the scoring. And then, yes, I thought that the penalty kick that Inter were awarded was questionable and controversial. I thought that it was a clean enough tackle. And one of the angles showed he got some of the ball before catching Barella. You know, and then, uh, honestly, I thought it was going to be one of those situations where even though Inter were awarded a PK that I didn't really agree with, I thought Alexis was going to miss the penalty because he's been historically terrible at taking penalty kicks. Lautaro's not been very good either. I could see why he handed the ball uh you know, to someone else to allow Alexis to score his first goal on the season. He was able to bury it. So it wasn't the same Inter as the one that beat Atalanta midweek. I thought that probably that match, uh, which was a dominant 4 nothing prior against Atalanta, uh, as I expected it could, I think it took a lot out of Inter emotionally and physically. And uh, Genoa nearly took advantage of that. Certainly, I tip my cap to Genoa. I thought they deserved more than what they got. Uh, you know, for Inter, it is getting them now a step closer to the Scudetto uh, and the second star. Thank you very much, Alex. That was wonderful. As Matt said, you actually called it probably to perfection better than we did. But, you know, you're in Terista and you know how you, you even know. I mean, we watch it as well, but you know how strong that team is. I, I'm going to say the best of, of the season by all means. The numbers say it, but also I would say the t within the top five also of Europe right now. 
Okay, so we are at, a, at break and we will have a special guest coming right up. We'll be back with you after these advertisements. Um, I don't know how to say it in American. We'll be right back after this commercial break. My name is Fabrizio Cardone, and I approve this message. Bentornati! Welcome back to La Lanterna Podcast. This is part two in our salotto, or in the pub. We are here with a special guest. Again, we had a few, several ones from Toronto, I guess, because it's my hometown, if, if, you, if I may say, Matt. But I want we want to welcome... Our special guest today, which is Ellie Zeldin. Welcome, Ellie. Welcome, welcome. Ciao, buon calcio a tutti. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite interesting and special, your story. So I'll first, obviously, welcome to our salotto, grab a beer, do whatever you want, and tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Long-time listener, first-time caller. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a Toronto kid who fell in love with football and and I fell in love with Genoa um and it's a bit of like a, a roundabout way but but you know like growing up in Toronto in the 90s I was a Blue Jays fan you know my earliest memory is watching the Blue Jays win their their first two World Series and and I remember the 1993 NHL playoff run run uh, with with you know Doug Gilmore and and leading the mm -hmm. team and and so like these are my core memories i have you know the raptors when the raptors came to toronto i remember their first game in their seasons playing in the in the sky dome um but uh, you know growing up where i did in toronto uh, sorry Ellie, yeah Ellie, sorry one, one quick thing just because for who's not in north america mm -hmm. or you know familiar with these sports not that i am anyways but uh blue jays is baseball, baseball. for toronto and uh and and yeah so the May, yeah lot. maple leafs those are the the, the, the hockey. hockey team the raptors yeah. basketball uh and uh and and that was sort of those were the big teams there's like an american football team here as well but you know nobody goes to the game but they actually share uh the soccer team stadium there, there wasn't any really like real football there was sort of some like lower leagues that everybody knew was was sort of corrupt and it was just sort of like semi-amateur or semi-pro uh and you know like every time a team came to toronto it would last a couple of years and then it would it would inevitably fold um but growing up where i did in Tor toronto first of all is is a city of immigrants right like i'm actually like a little bit of an anomaly amongst my group of friends because i'm actually i guess third generation toronto my great-grandfather came here from from lithuania in 1883 or 1884 or something um so so i'm a bit of an anomaly most of my friends are actually like first or second generation canadians right like they either came here or their parents came here uh and and everywhere in the world people play football and they and so toronto is a place where you you get a ton of footballers um uh because people come and bring bring their football traditions their cultures and their passion for it to toronto um so so it was always around me and i actually fell in love with football at first uh through tottenham hotspur because my best friend is uh his cousins are, are from north london and you know they had seats at white hart lane so my first football kid when i was a kid was actually a paul gas coin kid uh so so like i fell in love with football through through the english game but but it really when toronto fc came to toronto that's when when it was founded that's when when my passion started and i became involved in the supporters and uh one thing led to another and in 2013 me and uh, about a dozen other guys formed uh, 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 an ultra group something that we hadn't had in Toronto before we, we we looked around and we were like this is the mentality that we we have this is the atmosphere that we want um, and the club said to us you know we'll be surprised if we're talking to you in six months and then six years later I was standing on the capital stand as we lit flares and, uh, uh, you know in the last minute of the MLS Cup final that we won so it's it's you know it was, it's it's been a pretty incredible ride and I've been lucky enough to, to meet some really interesting people from all over the world in the process. One of them uh, is my friend Mauro, who's, uh, he's from Camogli, uh, grew up in Chiavari, uh, and uh, ended up in Toronto of all places in the, in the mid 90s. 
And so when he started coming to the stadium, he and I just became quick friends and, and you know, we, we became basically inseparable. Uh, and one day after work, we were having a beer and I was stressed and he looks at me and he says, Ellie, you need a vacation. <laughs> yeah, of course I do. Like, who doesn't? And he's like, you should come with me to, to Chiavri, uh, to Genoa, and we'll, we'll watch some games. I was like, yeah, actually, that doesn't sound so bad. He's like, yeah, we'll stay in my town, Chiavri. My friends are all there. Like, like I'll, like, I'll show you real Italy. I was like, yeah, okay, let's do this. So we went to, to, to Genoa in February 2015. That was the first time I went. We stayed in Chiavri, and, like, I fell in love with it. And, like, I, was, I think we were there for 10 days, and by the time I got back, I was, like, speaking Italian. And, like, <laughs> I, you know, I, like, I, like I, 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 it's hard for me to go to an Italian restaurant here in Toronto ever since then because, you know, once you, once you eat there, you know, Know, especially in Liguria, like nothing else so, compares. Sorry, just to jump in there, yeah. Matt. Matt, see, that's what you have to do: take your wife, go for a month in Cavity, go somewhere. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, we didn't we didn't do like Reco and all those other places. Oh, I say I, sh- I didn't when I was there several years ago. So I've got a couple of excuses to take her to some of those. Places. Yeah, you got to go get focaccia del Reco. Yeah, right. Exactly. I would literally fly just for that. Yeah, reason. like what's the point of going to Italy if? I wouldn't go to right. Italy without going there. I'd like drive across the country if I had to. Like it's yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You have to go back. But yeah, long story short, I fell in love and and I basically I like there were a couple of years there before COVID where Motto and I were going to sometimes three times a year to watch to watch games and we formed a little bit of a friendship with some of the ultras in Genoa. Uh, and and it, it's really interesting. Um, sort of like coming in as like because i i very much went to genoa the first time because i i wanted to learn i wanted to see what other people were doing in other stadiums and bring that back to to toronto because we're we're a young culture here and we can sort of have we have the privilege we have the, the luck of being able to cherry pick the best parts of other people's styles and traditions and maybe leave some of the darker parts like you know, back there. Um, sure. and, and, and so I, like, I, I travel for football. I, I'm a, I'm a stadium hopper. And so, and so it was really interesting to, to go to Genoa and sort of be introduced to Bomba, who's one of the capos of, of the ultras and, uh, and sort of just like be accepted. Uh, and they were like, yeah, you're one of us. Like you get it, you have the mentality and, and, you know, like I've, I'm so lucky. Like I've, I've seen some incredible games. I've seen Genoa, uh, play Lazio at home, play Fiorentina at home. I've been away to Empoli. I've been away to, to, to the San Siro. Like, like I'm, just, just because I fell in love with a team that's like, you know, most people look at me funny when the, um, the, I say Genoa is my football team and they're like, what, like the Salami? It's like, no, like the oldest fuck, excuse me, the, the oldest team in Italian football, like, please, like, and it's frustrating here because in Toronto, for anybody who's been to, to Toronto, you walk around and, and, and you see Juve jerseys, you say Inter, you say Milan, you say it like, yeah. you know, and it's like, you, you ask them, Hey, where's your family from? Like, I don't know, somewhere in the South body, maybe like, it's like, oh, you're not like, Every time. I know. Yeah, and so for me- Every single time. Every single time. More in the City B, when we were in City B, so that's more or less when we got a little bit more familiar with our pod. Mm-hmm. And if you, if anybody heard our some of our pods, you get like the true, the true, true tifoso. Um, and I'm, the first that comes to mind, just because he's the best uh, representation that I can think of, is uh, our friend Raffaello from from Cosenza mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and he's he much rather good for him because honor to to our brother um root for his Cosenza regardless of what league and whatnot but he is originally from from Cosenza rather than just rooting for a Serie A team that always wins or you know is uh, as we say in Italian blasonato which means that has had won a lot of Scudetti or stuff like that just because it's easy to pick one of those glory hunters yeah yes and and as an aside, actually, one of the guys that that was like one of the, that founded in Ibriati, the the ultra group in Toronto here, uh, he's he's a Cosenza t- also as well. And like on principle, because he's like my family's from there, I could like choose any team I want. But like no, that's Cosenza's my team. And and 
Now you have to explain what inebriati means. And in, inebriati is just um, oh, it's it's a we're sort of it's like inebria. It's it's the Illuminati, right? Like a shadowy group of of people who control the world. But but we're we're also just a bunch of drunk idiots because we like to go to the stadium <laughs> and have some beers and jump around. So it's it's because also what we do, like what we, it's like for 90 minutes a week we play ultra like we dress up in our stone island and we're all black and we go to the stadium and we sing but it's kind of tongue-in-cheek like i i work for a non-profit right like i'm not i'm not that guy right? and right. that's what i was saying as well a little bit about being able to to like here in north america be able to to take the traditions that were that that from where we come from or 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 that we admire like and take the cool parts take the flags take the take the songs but like you know some of the the, the political driven violence and and like hatred like no I'm right. fine leaving that in the past or in the <laughs> old country right like i'm i'm good with that i it, but toronto's weird as well like it, we have I, I i love telling the story as well it's so funny because it, it we have like Serbian guys who support Red Star Belgrade standing next to uh, Turkish guys who support Galatasaray. They stand shoulder to shoulder every week in in in, in the stands on the Gradinata, jumping, singing for Toronto. So it's 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 Toronto is a it, like it's it's not like Genoa where you're born a Genoano and that's your family, that's your history, right? Like uh, and like I, I kind of get that. I. I I have a couple of friends who are Doriano and I still don't get them. I think they're kind of a, maybe, maybe a little sick in the head or something. Like I, I just don't, I don't understand it because there's a history in Genoa that you don't have with the Sampdoria, right? Like, doesn't make any sense. like why, why take the no name brand when, when you can get the, why, why take the imitation when you're going to have the real thing and it's right there. It's authentic. It's real. It's genuine. Like it's, and it's still alive right like right. Genoa is, might be the oldest team it might be the first team in Italy but it's it, it, we're not dead we're not like some third or third division team like we're not in City of C you know like yeah, we're not Italian, right? but you know it, it goes to show you like a team like so I was at the 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 derby in Chiavari against um um sorry it's been a long day and I've had a drink um it, oh, in uh, Ella Cesare Levante. Cesare Levante, sorry, yes. Yeah. Uh, as, uh, you know, and like Cesare Levante is also a historic team, you know what I mean? And like they're just coming up from Serie C now as well. So it's, it's you know, and Genoa has been there. So, but we're, we're still very much alive and a breathing thing. And, and, and it doesn't matter if we're in A or we're in C or D, you know, like the, the, the Gradinata Nord will be full because that's, that's what being a Genoano means, right? And, and like, I personally think it almost comes stems back from the days of of the Middle Ages, where twelve uh, hundreds, thirteen hundreds, where you were sticking because of different reasons. It's not necessarily around the sports factor, but you're like sticking around behind your little republic or you know little duke ship or whatever that might be. And since then, it always have like. Uh, I would say Tuscany would be one of the biggest examples of that, um, where, where there's this huge, like humongous rivalry between the different cities. And obviously, as to your point, like we have this fake <laughs> Genoa or not Genoa type of a team that is associating, they're trying to associate themselves to Genoa. But um, no, it's, it's true, like Cesare Levant and so on. Th these are like, uh, old towns, very beautiful, uh, you know, coastal and, and so on. Plus, they have their own history. And mm -hmm. not on, on top of that, also like their history from a soccer perspective or a football perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's it's it, it always makes me very appreciative of, of like of actually like being able to still access that have access to these clubs like at, at such a grassroots level as well because in, in north america it's so much more uh sterilized it's a hygienic experience That's and very and, and yeah. yeah and and so like it's really cool that like you know with Cesar Levante is what, like 1909 they were founded? Like they, they, they were, they've been in the top flight before, but but now they're also still playing out of like their little provincial stadium and anybody can climb the fence and like yell at the team during practice. Like it's, 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 
but that's what being a club is like you're a member of a club if you if you're supporting a, a badge it's not because they're they've got cristiano ronaldo or because they have the most scudetto or whatever right it's because like that badge is supposed to mean something and so for me like i'm like i've taken on the the meaning of being a genuano very like seriously right because i like going back to my point about being welcomed by by bomba when i first showed up uh, it's like okay, they they they've accepted me, and like I have to I have to throw myself into it. But like, I'm so happy I have because I've had all these crazy experiences. Like, I never thought that I'd be standing in the middle of fucking Genoa in the middle of the night lighting flares is, uh, for the 130th anniversary. It's it's these are things you don't dream of. You were there? Yeah, yeah, I was there that night. Uh, what? Okay, so. Uh, I, I spent a, a month in Chiavari, right, for, for my honeymoon. That's right. Uh, That's right. And, and my wife loves Chiavari. I took her there. Uh, so I, I got engaged to her in June 22, like, on our way there because okay. I said, Pam, I have to show you this town that I love so much. Like, this is, this is where I want to live. This is where I want to live. Sorry, small parenthesis. Yeah. Again, who doesn't really know? It's, it's this small town uh, between La Spezia and more or less. Just to give you an example, just to understand, between Genova and La Spezia, mm-hmm. it, it's still within the province of, of Genova. Mm-hmm. It, it's probably the biggest town, city, small city uh, outside of uh, Genova, within the province of Genova. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a very pretty town with cobblestone streets at times, uh, ins and outs, because there's the city that is sort of divided in. Not in two, but it's divided because the the train st- the train ra- the railway uh, kind of passes through, so you have to either go above or below. Um, then then this older part of the town where you have all these what we call them portici, which are basically mm-hmm. it's a covered sidewalk mm-hmm. where all your beautiful um, uh, stores or whatnot that are there. So even with any type of temp, because it's 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 very mild. Be- very i would say mildly mild mm-hmm. uh, because we're not down south like in southern uh province uh, re- regions or whatnot but still so even if it rains or whatnot you're still pr- protected so you can still go out even during the winter mm-hmm. and and it's such a beautiful feeling that you get it in genova as well mm-hmm. but the difference is it's the city versus the town right and and so sorry Go, go on, Alex. Sorry. No, 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 no. It's a perfect description. And I was like hoping that you won't give too much away because like we're trying to move there, but we don't want all the other munja cakes from North America to come. Yes. Fun, fun, no offense, fun Matt. You're welcome. You're welcome. Italian town that's somewhere in not Liguria <laughs> that you've never heard of and no yeah. one likes to go to. But, uh, but yeah, so, like so that that's our favorite place. So initially our plan was to get married in August in in Chiavari, but my dad can't fly for health reasons. So we said, no problem, we'll get married in Toronto. But as a, as a, uh, it's a sacrifici, right? Like, well, we're gonna have to do a month of a, a honeymoon to make up for it in Chiavari, like, no on. problem. <laughs> <laughs> like, like uh, so, so that's how we justified it. And, and, and Pam didn't know this at the time, but like part of the reason why I had like really pushed for like August and like going to Italy for the honeymoon was because I knew that that was also the start of the season. <laughs> But here I am and like got busy with the wedding, dragged my feet, didn't buy a season pass for, for the Gradi Nord, and everybody wants a ticket. So like I actually didn't make any Genoa games the whole month that I was there. And, and really the one I wanted to see was was the the, the game with Napoli. But but uh, I wasn't gonna about to make my wife climb a, a fence to get out on the Gradi Nord, and there's no way in hell that I'm gonna watch a game anywhere else but there, right? Like I'd, I'd, I'd rather not watch the game there at all. Um, uh, oh, I remember messaging you, and you were almost saying, "I have to pick either my marriage or Genoa." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's too early in the marriage. So, so, so I, I settled on going to three Intella games because it was a ten minute walk from our from our apartment. Um, but, but one of the things that we ended up doing was spending spending a couple of days in Genoa, like over the course of the month, and we would like rent an Airbnb. So, one of the nights that that I that we decided to go in. No, it happened to also be the 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 sixth of December uh, of of September, and we went out for dinner and we went back to our Airbnb and it was like a five uh, five minute walk from like the the piazza where where everybody was meeting and and so then I spent the night out out there just you know 
watching the fireworks and 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 part of the corteo it was it was just it's really special to see like how how special genoa is to so many people and like the love that everybody has and and like you know and, and i i always say it in a society in a world where we're and I'm I'm a, I'm a secular person. I'm an, I'm I'm a, a very not observant person uh, uh, by any means. But but in a, in a more and more secular world, I think humans crave like that communal ritual that that we we've lost uh, that we've given up when we stop going to, to church or synagogue or mosque or, or what have you. And and I think the stadium replaces that, and that's a really cool place because it's pluralistic and it's and it's sort of like very um, it, the 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 playing field is sort of level there is really no like rich or poor at the stadium we're all there to sing for the team to support the team and and so i, th I think it's like actually like a really i i really enjoy being part of those moments of of just like the chaos but also the 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 joy the passion um because the passion the pride is is real and in, in some and it's something that that like shouldn't be taken lightly either. And, and that brings me to ask you this question. So you started to say that you started to know about Genoa because of your friend Mauro, mm -hmm. who brought you, the, the, the talked to you more about it and, and, and about the, the, the passion and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So then when you started to get a little bit more closer to the colors, understand better the history, you even did mention about why pick the fake side of Genoa, pick the, the right side. but. Uh, why also, I guess this was a similar thing that happened also to Matt, uh, where, you know, he was playing with a pick, 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 pick up soccer and whatnot. And people are saying, why Genoa? He's like, well, it's fuck because I fucking like it or whatever, you know, right? Uh, because of the colors or what, what was the, what were the things or the thing that, uh, that, that caught more made you become or stick with it uh it's it, you know it's it's a perfect question to segue from there as well because a football club like it is a community right that's it's you're part of a club and so so for me it's 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 um the connections right like it's the people the people are, are what draw me in and, and like and motto is my best friend i didn't really have a uh any skin in the game when it came to italian football so it was sort of like yeah of course like now i support genoa so they're your team bro they're my team uh and and because that is i for me it's much more fun to watch games with when you're rooting for somebody like i'm, I'm, I'm not good as a neutral I, i i need i need a good guy and i need a villain uh so to speak and and um And, and and so my connection with Mauro and his his passion for Genoa and the way he spoke about it and the pride he spoke about it. And personally, there are things that resonated with me. Like I studied history at university. Like I've always read history. Um, and and so like when you say this is the first professional team in, in Italy, this is the, the because of because of Genoa is why, you know, we call the manager in Italy, Mr. You know, the, right. the, even the even the story with with the St. George's Cross. Right. Like and how. And, and the story of why England and all the other republics of of, of Italy adopt the cross is like, oh, Genoa are like the OGs. They're they're they are like the original trendsetters. Um, so so for me, that was like a very big part of the cell, um, and just like that tradition, like being being it, like, and and. To, to be completely honest, I'm I'm a little bit of a hipster as well. I'm not going to choose that if I, like if I'm not from if I'm not from a family that's like Juve or like or like whatever some club, whatever like I'm not going to choose the club that's actually going to be doing very well. Part of the reason why I really started getting into Spurs when I when I when I started following football more, you know, around 2007, um, was because they were they were kind of shit. Right, like they they had they had something there, but they they weren't a good team. They weren't that, like I didn't want to be accused of being a glory hunter. Um, but again, I ultimately going back to the question, none of that those things would have mattered had it not been for the people. So had it not been for Maro, had it not been for Bomba uh, and his son uh, Pepe, uh, and, you know, and, and and his wife Jessica, like and and the guys from from the all of the clubs, right? Like like there's there's you saw in the Gradi not to note yourself. There's like a million different clubs, like Origina. There's Five R. Uh, there's Gav, like uh, Spiloncia, Brigata, like all of these. And, and, and it's really interesting because like, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit of like a novelty or I'm a little bit exotic because I'm, I'm like the, the Canadian guy that, that comes to watch games. Like I kind of can like navigate, it seems a little bit through everybody. Like 
I sort of show a pop up and be like, oh, I'm from Toronto. And they're like, oh, yeah, I've heard about you here. Like, here's a flag. Wave it. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's it, yeah, it's um, it's the people. It's really the people. And, and like, uh, if you want to talk about the environment as well, like, there's no stadium in all of Italy that looks like the Ferraris. Like, like there is absolutely no more beautiful stadium and no more unique stadium than 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 the Marassi. Thinking about this, and you're absolutely correct and true of every single word you said. So it's essentially like a family. It's like a passion. It's like a a sect almost sometimes, depending on the point of views that you look at it. But then you get the ups and downs so the fact of still sticking around that means something as you said it probably ties back on the fact that you're tied to the people you're tied to that 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 passion the friendship and and, and that happened and so on but i think especially not only last year where you actually no i'm going to go even more i mean that this has been going on forever but the more visible because thanks to social media and whatnot matt is our our witness when he went to 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 the to Ferraris right at the tail end, the last match of our year of relegation. We already knew we were in Serie B. We we were already relegated. We lost even to nothing, if I'm not mistaken. He went to this match. It was already a given that we were. It was mathematical already certain that we were in Serie B. And even though we had lost after that match, he went around the the city with 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 the fans again. Uh, uh, you know, flares, flags, chants, etc. And I think that was another step in his genuinity, <laughs> if I may say, mm-hmm. that showed this, I don't know, passion, something above and beyond what you are used to. When you talked about the st- being sterile here in North America. What, what would you say to someone that does not know anything about soccer, football, Genoa, and, and it's 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 uh, fans. Oh, that's that's like okay. Let's break that down a little bit. So, you know, football in and of itself, like we all we all understand, is like uh, all, there's like a universal language. You can go anywhere in the world and talk football. Uh, uh, so, so that's like for a North American who, who who's not really exposed to it to begin with, they don't understand that. So, like that's the starting point. Um, and then and then when when you talk about belonging to a club it's it's much more like in in north america we are consumers of entertainment that is provided by a franchise called let's say the the toronto raptors the technically basketball club or the toronto maple leafs hockey club um but the club is is sort of like a moot point it's almost like a nod to it, it's just like a, it, it's archaic basically at this point but nobody's really it, it, i guess i suppose technically it's keeping up a facade there's no club about it we're meant to go to the stadium to watch the big screen between plays to watch the play and pull it and clap politely and stuff our faces with overpriced popcorn and hot dogs and beers I'll, and one thing I'll say is that in Toronto, it's eighteen dollars for a beer in the stadium. It's not even worth it. Wait, that that's Canadian dollars. Canadian dollars, so, and, and you're yeah, and you're and you're paying, you're paying. You know, if I want to take my wife to a Raptors game, we're sitting up in the nosebleed. I'm still spending seventy dollars a ticket, right? So, it, it, right. it's it. There, there's nothing about being a club there, and, and the, the environment is dead. Yeah. They have, the, you know, in, in the NBA, they have they they have like spirit squads, the kids that they pay to like go behind the nets with their thunder sticks and clap and get people going and like between the plays to go on the wave the flags. And I always tell, but like, Pam hates it. My wife hates it when we go to basketball games. And I always say, I do that for free. Yeah, I do. And I do a better job, right? Like, it, it, like pull on the balaclava, pull off the shirt. Let's go! I, you know, like get people going. So, but, but, but it's it's true. And like, we actually Toronto has a, like a farm team. It's called or like a, like a, an academy, and they play in a, the, the the NBA G League. It's like a development league, and they play out in Mississauga. And and when they first their first season, Anibriati, the group out here, we went and we supported basketball because. Um, at, part of the reason why why, why we had the impetus to do it as well was because some of the guys that were that were heavily involved in them were also like Olympiacos fans, and those guys just want any 
breeze to life flares. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they're fantastic. But um, but uh, we went through the games, and by the third game, they asked us to not come back anymore. So it's like North America just isn't built for that mentality, and that's and and that goes into to, to about being part of the club. You're not there to be a consumer. You're there to support the team, to be part of the team. You're not on the field. You're in the stands. You're support. You're providing the support, the atmosphere, the home field advantage. The you know you're that's and selfishly we're living vicariously through these players because like now I'm older than these guys like I'm in, I'm closer to 40 now than I am 30 like or to, so I'm nowhere close to playing I'm living vicariously through these guys so I want to support them as if they it was me on that field um, and that's something that North Americans don't have a hard time wrapping their head around and then when it comes to Genoa um, the only way I could describe it is like there's nothing pure in Italian football that's not fair. That's not fair to Napoli, and that's not fair to like some of these smaller t- uh, clubs as well. But but in terms of like some of the big traditional historic clubs, like it's it, the, we are the genesis of, of of Italian football. It stems from us. So like uh, respect your daddy, I guess. It's I mean it's it's so like strong though. Like it, it's something incredibly unique and genuine. If you're going to Morassi, if you're going to see a match and. It seems like maybe there's been some revitalization in the last several seasons, but even then, like it's just different. And like Fabri was kind of talking earlier, like my the thing that stuck with me when I had been able the one time I visited and gone, um, ended up getting hooked up with this guy that was there who Fabri had known somehow. I think he was following the Genoa Club Toronto pages or something from afar. Uh, shout out Enrico, and we were talking before the match and everything, and it's like it's a different concept of sport and this is the best way to say the difference between the two things on mm-hmm. one hand it's very much it's not exactly passive because people definitely have it's an identity thing like you know a, a maple leafs fan will tell you they're as much diehard crazy about the maple leafs as anybody else is but the way that the game and the culture has gone and the way that uh it is for most of us in north america you don't get the same experience where you're getting into right behind the ground for two pounds or two two European uh, two euros, and then waving a flag and being active in the entire match to the point where really you can't even see the match; you're just part of it. Yeah, like it's that's not it's a totally, totally, totally different experience. I haven't seen a match in Toronto at home, or I guess any of the away matches either that I've been to, like actually live. Like I've had my back turned to the to the field the whole time uh, because yeah. because I'm 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 the Lanciacorti, right? Like I'm I'm calling the songs, I'm leading the crowd. Um, and like, I think I would, I, I always joke, like I have with people, like, I don't even know if I actually like the damn game because like, I've never actually seen one. Uh, that, that's not true, but like, like, I don't know if, if I would, how, if I would know how any other way of being in the stadium, I'm, I'm a bit of an outlier when it comes to this. And I think this is why Genoa as well and, and, and like football in general, but like a club like Genoa as well speaks to me uh, in the early 2000s. So like I'm, we're talking like 2000, 2001, 2002, three, maybe early four. I was really into punk rock, like street punk, oi, like the hardcore stuff. And so I would hang out downtown in Toronto and I would clean car windshields during the day. And I would use the money I made to get a homeless guy to buy me a 40 of old English, like this cheap malt liquor. And I would get wasted in the alley behind this building at the corner there. That was the concert venue. And me and my friends would sneak in and we would like mosh, be in the mosh pit and be listening to punk rock and like, you know, being kids. Uh, At the same time, uh, so like, I I love the chaos of, of a punk rock concert i love i love that mentality uh and the energy at the same time i was also actively involved in like the anti-war protests against against uh the war in iraq and uh for causes here in toronto and you know i loved i thrived being at 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 a a protest especially ones that maybe got almost a little testy and maybe some people were 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 pushing the cops around maybe you're trying to to test the cops or you know it was heated and you could feel the passion could feel the tension um and uh, so like sort of like that that being united in a cause the, that feeling in the stadium really speaks to me as well and then I, I love sports of all kind like I'll watch cricket I'll watch I'll watch tennis I'll watch uh, just about anything because I I, I, I love you know, I guess you know I'm, I'm a guy I grew up playing sports like I love I find it entertaining. Um, yeah. so the stadium and, and football for me sort of encapsulates sort of all of these weird sort of like niche things that I really enjoy doing. Um, 
I always say that going to a game is sort of like one part going to a punk rock concert, one part going to a political protest, one part going to a sporting event. But the difference here with the sporting event is that you're not, as you said, a passive consumer. You're, you're not, it's not like going to the movies. You, uh, uh, at the sporting event, you are involved. You are part of this event. Um, it's like, well, it's like going to, again, going to church, like, or, or, or I, going to synagogue. There, there, there are parts of the, of the service where the whole congregation will, you know, sing together. And anybody who tells you that when like, you know, if you're in a room like that and, and everybody like hits a, a note together, it's like, if that doesn't send shivers down your spine, then like maybe you're a sociopath or something. I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah, like the, you got to get your head examined. Uh, and the and the stadium is like it's it's just it's moment after moment of chills like that just just like of of like the energy of thousands of human beings pulling for the same thing at the same time you know like it's 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 just electric and and I, I, I you said it as well Matt there's something so genuine there's something so authentic about about the yeah. Gradinata North there's something so I don't know different it, it, it's just like you it, and and you know it is because when you go all their places in italy and they're like well who's your they say who's your team or if they see you with something like like i have genoa stickers on my luggage like Gen genoa toronto it's like yeah like what why like sometimes people can't wrap their head around it. like why wouldn't you love you it's like because then it means I have to follow Cristiano Ronaldo to Saudi Arabia and I'm not waking up at, at like three in the morning to watch Saudi Arabia games, right? Like, right. Uh, like if I want to watch bad football, I'll just walk down the street and watch it here in Toronto. Like I do that every week anyways. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not going to get into P Toronto TFC, even though it might look like a little bit better this year. Mm -hmm. But I, it re you remind me um, when you were talking about certain things, about one of our past guests. His name is uh, Alex Brotherton. He was a Man City fan. And one thing that he did say was, besides, you know, he thought, EP, rightfully so, I don't, I'm not going to get into that too much, but the fact that EPL a little bit better than the city, I went on. But he did say that the fan in, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because the man is doing like, who cares <laughs> with the hand. But um, he did say that the, uh, the spectacle, the feeling, the atmosphere in Italy is, as we say in Italian, ineguagliabile, mm -hmm. means mm -hmm. not equal it yeah. by all means, even with, and I'm using the quote-unquote here, the EPL, which is considered, again, quote-unquote, the best soccer in the world. And again, it's like the EPL is farther ahead in the project that I think, I, and it, as fans, we should all be on guard, uh, uh, we should all be mindful of is, is the sterilization of the game. Uh, the, the English Premier League has actually taken a lot of notes from like the NFL, from the NBA, uh, from trying to figure out how to, how to like it, tamp down on, on like they tangentially are, you know, maybe fan violence, but really it's, it's like, how do you sell more advertising? Because if there are less banners being hung up, you can, there's more space for you to put up advertising, right? Like it, it like, I, I truly believe I'm maybe call me cynical, but that's really how these, some of these organizations are no, thinking. No, no. Um, and, and, and so England is farther along it like, look at Juve, you know, like, like, uh, that, Th their fan base like is 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 all over the world they seem to be everywhere but their stadium is kind of quiet right like um it, they seem to be a club without a soul but like we also know that there are a bunch of lying bastards robbers and dopers so like uh, like it, uh, and especially with the super league shit and, and yelly can go rotten hell uh, excuse i'm sorry for saying this but and like you know but like but but <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but, um, yeah, like that, that's not a team. That's like a franchise and that's sort of like the, the North American model. Um, so like why go all the way to Italy for what I have at home? Right. Like, like I, I can, I can get that here. I, I, I like, it scares me the way that the, the game is going, but the fans in England also, they always have a different, a different mentality, but like since Thatcher as well, you've seen there, there's a different intensity in the fans and that's where you get this whole thing. Well, oh, we only sing the same song, these same couple songs and like it's banter. It's like, bad, yeah, but it's kind of fucking boring. And like, I, I'm a Tottenham fan this weekend. We, we, we came back and we won three, one, um, 
but only in the second half. And the stadium was quiet. And it was only once we got our, our the, the the tying goal that the, sta- the the crowd really got behind the team. And it's like, why sit through 60 minutes of, of, of anxiety when you can actually maybe like create a little bit of an atmosphere and give the team a bit of an edge, right? Like, like why, like if you can do something, why, why not, why aren't you doing it? Right. Um, so, so there's a different mentality in England. The, the fans in, on the continent are, are incredible. What I love about the fans in Italy and, uh, and I, you know, there are dark parts of, of, of Tifosi culture uh, in, in, in Italy as well, but there's a little bit of a playfulness. There's a little bit of like a, a tongue in cheek element to it, like, like, or a wink and a nod. Like they also know that it's a bit of a laugh at there. It's, it's a little bit of a, of a game. Um, to a certain extent, like, like, don't get me wrong. There's tons of violence with the police and amongst other fans and, and like fans die, right? Like it's what it's, it, we're just celebrating the 30th anniversary or the 31st anniversary of, um, of, uh, Spagna, right? Espanol. Espanol. Yeah. So, so, you know, that, that it is there, but, but like, again, I've, I've, I've had small parenthesis for who's not too, too familiar with it. This was a young kid back then that unfortunately got killed because of stab- being stabbed from a Milan fan yeah. just outside the doors of the stadium before the match. So, yeah, to, to, rightfully so. So Ellie's point is 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 dear fault for the fact of this should not happen. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. Like I think, like what what was that game against? Um, what was it, Siena? When when we had the match called uh, called off when it was four one, like and and a lot of daspos were handed out for that. But that's absolutely what you should be doing as a fan of a club. And that again, going back to the first thing, like I think a lot of North Americans have that hard time wrapping their head around it. Um, but, but yeah, like if you're, that was the match that we we called the the, the players to have their their jerseys. jerseys, right? Like mm-hmm. like you don't deserve to wear this shirt, right? Um, and and like, listen, people, like we're not the ones to send the head of a pig yeah. to the to the presidents. Yeah, that was just embarrassing. Though. That wasn't even like a. It wasn't even like a scary movie. It was like, man, you guys watch too many like mob boss movies. Like, what's yeah. going on? But like, I, and again, this is no disrespect to my friends in Greece or Serbia, but like, there, there's like a darkness as well to to, the, to to some of the football, the elements of football culture yeah. there that 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 Italy does lack. Um, and I, the, and and generally, you go to the stadium, or at least for me in Genoa, it's like, yeah, that like like it, it's a bit of a laugh. It's 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 a it's a bit of fun. Um, uh, it, it's it's a little bit of uh, there's something a little bit playful to it as well, right? But oh, man, it's it's making me just want to go back, and I'm I'm like I'm on a little bit of a tangent now, just like thinking about all no, the but, things. No, but but Ellie, I, I like where you're going with it though, because like I, so I'll be honest. Obviously, we um, match against the Inter didn't go the way we wanted it to go, but the the support was all over social, just seeing. Uh, Rosso blue colors and seeing how loud we were. I was chirping my Inter friends hard the whole time. Like, I don't think there are any Inter fans at this match. Is anybody else watching the game besides Genoa fans? Well, wait, wait, wait. To their defense, I have to be honest. To their defense, there was some sort of protest that they were, that was going on. So also that did help to our cause, which is fine. I don't care. But at the same time, I, I, sorry, just one thing I wanted to to, to, sh- to share that on the on our social social media pages that I had uh, posted this thing about this um, on the Genoa um, uh, website, on the Genoa social, sorry. This guy that was by chance in in Milan, he went to watch the match. So this was uh, in Genoa and was from London and he's a supporter of West Ham. He, He wrote all these words and saying, I'm here just by chance for my birthday. And I have to say, this is the best fan uh ship that i've ever seen on an away game yeah that's fucking awesome because you know that guy's been to like championship game two and west ham were down and stuff like that so he's seen it and like the thing the reason why i brought that whole thing up it was obviously an incredible showing there but it reminded me of the one time that i had gone myself and like while you're in that section with the ultras it's not like a bunch of guys with bandanas and scarves and you know whatever else they might be carrying like there were like families right next to me too. yeah like there's there's like a combination it's not just like a bunch of hardcore dudes with like some sketchy tattoos about some weird like ideological stuff 
Like it's a lot of like normal people who are just really vocal for something they care a lot about. The guy, the guy who who like leads the ultras in Genoa, or like who is like at least organizing like the tifos and like and and handing out the pyro and organizing the pyro show for the for the anniversary. He looks like my uncle Art, right? Like he's like he's like a dentist yeah. who wears glasses. I was like, yeah. you know, and the first time I came here, I was like, this is this is your like capo. It's like ah yeah. okay, because like again like. Uh, you, you, your listeners can't see me. I'm not a big guy. I'm like five eight, 170 pounds. Like you know, I keep in shape, but like I'm no, I'm no, I'm not a lean, mean fighting machine. Like uh, like I'm not threatening, right? And so I, I always had a little bit of, a, of an imposter syndrome as as the capo and as as, as Lanciacori here in Toronto, uh, because I always sort of like I had this image from like maybe watching too much, uh, too many movies like Green Street Elite or or Okolo football or like you know or or, or the it's YouTube videos the yeah yeah the, yeah, the or YouTube yeah. videos thinking like you have to be this like tough intimidating guy it's like no I'm actually just a really good Lanciacori and I'm good at my job and actually the best thing I can do is being to be a capo and to, to to, to lead a group and to, to lead, uh, especially here in, in, in North America, like a nascent community is, is to be friendly and welcoming and to bring people yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. I love this so much, then maybe other people should, and, and it's a joy to share it with them. And that's well, actually like the, I think the, the main lesson I took, especially for my first time in Genoa was the lesson I took and I continue to take, uh, and it goes back to being part of a club. It's like, you're never too old. You're never not cool enough to, to be part of, uh, uh, of, of Genoa, to be part of a club, to, to, to have a home on the Gradina to Nord. Like you, you are, you're important you know, as a Genoano. And, and I think that's really cool. So before we get into the, the next match, which I, I, I suppose is where we're, we're, we'll, we'll, everybody's also waiting for, but yeah. there's a couple of things that I wanted to talk about, uh, sorry, to, to, to wrap with, mm-hmm. is Lancia Coro, of course, means, uh, just for who doesn't know, is that individual that is in front, as he said, he's not watching the match. And you were who's not used to that is like what does that mean he's essentially watching the whole gradinat and or curva because most of italy is more uh accustomed to hear the word curva which is the stands right and they have usually depending on the stadiums if they allow it or not they have these megaphones or they just screech out of their lungs and and these are the ones that are the ones that start the chance starts the song start every type of cheering possible imaginable so they are the heart of the tifo and i have to share with everyone that is listening right now that ellie is that person that i've shared a few times and i know it was quite for a long time and still is circling around all social media and that means everywhere about this group of English speaking people, because you could hear it from the accent, that were chanting with their hearts, Blu cerchiato pezzo di merda. <laughs> so I have to say, watch it on YouTube, watch it on our pages on social, sh- search it. This was nonetheless Mr. Ellie. Tell us a little bit more about that. <laughs> yeah, that was, I think that was like 2016 or 17. Uh, and, and it was the start of the season. I think it was my first game. It was the first home game of the season, maybe the second one. No, but for first TFC. Home, for TFC, yeah. Uh, our season in, in Canada and the MLS season is, runs from, uh, well, the first game was two weeks ago. So like end of February, uh, through the regular season ends in October. And then they have the playoff format that ends in, in early December. Um, so I had just come back from, from like, a, I think it was like a, an early spring trip, like a couple of, well, model what i will do is like seven days like three games say, or like for sure it was with Mahalo, yeah for sure. it was it's like an we call it an in and out it's like between seven and ten days and, and and we see like three or four games uh between genoa and intella because like we always stay in, in chiavri and so like i i've got i've got like uh, some homies and the gradinata suit at at, at at intella i gotta i gotta shout out my boys there because they're also the fam but um uh but yeah so i i come back and so i was like still i had i, I was still feeling genoa i was still in my my genoa like vibes and 
and I always go whenever I come back. I always I always come back inspired, and I always end up writing songs. Like I came back and I wrote I wrote so, words for um, Sara Perché Ti Amo for Toronto, and like uh, and Montagna Verdi for Toronto after being away on a on a trip to Italy because uh, you know that's the whole point. It's research and development. Only I could write it off for my taxes. Uh, uh, so I come back and and the boys are there and people are asking me about the trip and like I'm I'm getting hyped up and we're about to go to the stadium. Uh, uh, and so I sort of get everybody together because we always sort of walk together. We all go into the stadium together so we can get our banners up and, and whatnot. And and so somebody happened to be capturing this as well as I did it. Uh, and I said, hey, guys, I'm going to teach you a, a chant for Genoa. Oh, I had somebody filming because I was like, I want to send it to my friends in Genoa. I just like want to WhatsApp that to, uh, to them and like so they can like like you guys saying hi. So I said for my buddies, like follow me, say, repeat after me. And so I led them through the first time blue, like the color blue, you know, Cercato, fu cercato pezzo di merda. I'm like, if you're from Toronto, you know pezzo di merda. You you have a couple Italian friends, you know vaffanculo and and like and like porco dio, like and all those things. Right? Like, <laughs> forgive my language. I'm sorry, Nona, if you're listening. Like earmuffs. Um, but uh, but so like th- those words were easy. So and and again, we have a chant, you know, against Montreal. To the same boom, 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 boom. So it was, it was easy for them. So like, yeah, we can do this. Blue cercato pezzo di merda. And and I so like I I think I sent it to to like Bomba and some of my friends there, uh, and I posted it on my Instagram and went to the stadium, uh, and it was like an earlyish game. I think it was like like uh, six o'clock in the evening or, or maybe seven o'clock. So it's like late over there, but people I guess were like late night surfing, doom scrolling Instagram, and they came across the video, and it just. I like. I came out of the stadium. And my phone was blowing up. I was like, "The sh- fuck happened?" It went viral. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's my one and only moment of going viral. <laughs> that's awesome. All right, we heard all about what is to be a Genuano. It's just the 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 the, the tip of the iceberg. To to be truthful, you have to go and feel it to get it more inside of your skin. Um, mm. But. After, as, as Matt has said, like after the, the disappointing, sad, or angry, or a mix of all of the above against Inter, um, I, I want to quote before we get into the next match a, 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 some words from our, our, our goalie, super goalie, uh, Joseph Martinez, who said, mm-hmm. We will revenge this defeat with all of you, meaning, you know, going towards. Uh, talking to the fan uh, uh, at home with all of you against Monza. So, General Monza, match day 28, it's going to be something else or is it going to be because virtually, everyone's saying, virtually we have the safety from relegation. Uh, We've seen throughout, especially... In, 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 in the second half of, of the last, the, these 20, 28, 27 matches that we've done so far, the quality that Giladino has, has taught to our team, uh, has made this team, has created and so on, also thanks to the quality of also all of our players, not to exclude anyone. And, and also a little bit of managerial stability as well. I think that's... That's wonderful. That, that's really helping him out. Not to sort of interrupt you. No, not at all. Thank you for that. That's absolutely truthful. Even Gilardino, in his last words after the match, he did say, "I'm thankful for this, for this team, for the club that is uh, is truthfully believing in me, is allowing me to grow, build, and create, and that's super incredible and important for a, for a manager, for a mister, as you said. Mm-hmm. And so next one coming up. On Saturday, General Monza. Monza, with our beloved, whoever lived, Genoa in the 90s uh, or in the 2000s, actually, with, uh, with uh, Milito, also had another great player that actually is very dear to our hearts anyways, is uh, Raffaele Paladino. So we've seen one of the first times that you see an emerging, emerging uh, uh, coach that was actually a forward. Usually you see either defenders or midfielder, and he was like a forward. So he's going against what the belief is, and Giladino is another one too, right? So this is a different type of trend. So two great names, 
because Raffaele Pardino might have not been to the levels of Gilardino, but for us, they're equally important. Yeah, yeah, and it's like it's like being in a glass box of emotions to take a quote from Anchorman when 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 something like this happens as well, because you also want to see a player like that with that with that history with the club do well, just not when they play us. And like, so to speak about that duality really quickly, uh, I haven't watched actually the the the, the Inter game yet because I was busy, um, and so so I've been meaning to watch it, and and not only because I want to see. General play, but also because there was a Canadian on Inter who came on as a substitute, Tejan Buchanan, mm -hmm. and so like unfortunately, I, I, I find myself watching Inter games quite a bit these days because I'm trying to support that. But like, I'm very conflicted about. It's like you know, like I want to be happy when I see Tejan come on, but like God, I hope somebody breaks his ankles in those like 30 minutes. Not actually, we need him for the national team, but you know what I mean. Like it's it's a it's a strange feeling. Um, but this game is a must win, right? Like virtual virtual safety is not actual safety right like like uh we don't have we don't have salvation yet uh, and there's still a long way to go and if we're gonna and if we're gonna be able to 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 stay in syria and and you know like continue on this project monza who is a team that's that's you know like sitting right ahead of us um is like an absolutely must win. If we if we draw with them, our record is the same, right? Like it's I'm, what is it? Yeah, three points so, apart, right? Yeah, right. Like like that's 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 right where we need to be. I think at this stage in the project, first year back in in A, um, you know, like giving the manager the keys and 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 the faith and and the support to build his team and to play his team his way. Um, so it, it, this is one of those games where it's like, yeah, they're not a, a big team. Uh, this is one where, where, where we must win. And it doesn't necessarily have to be pretty as well, like, like, but it, we, we have to figure out a way of winning it. So uh, that's because that's going to help us in, in, a, in a long way in, in, in our, our journey to stay up. And, and again, like, as I said, I'm a Spurs fan. There's a saying in football called being Spursy. And, and like, so maybe I'm just, I'm, I'm just like, you know, used to it but like i never i had nothing safe for me until until as they say you know the final whistle so um we need these three points and and i think as, as you know as martin has said like we need that momentum because actually there's been some incredible momentum this season um it's been a joy to, like our last year in syria like two years ago was it was painful to watch uh but it's it's a lot of fun to watch these players play uh and sometimes again like it's i'm sorry to keep talking about tottenham hotspur on and toronto fc on on a on a, a genoa podcast but there's some parallels there because because small parenthesis you stole a stragazzi no i'm joking go ahead uh, <laughs> and, and romero, and romero, romero. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but 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 it's a again there's some parallels there because it's like a new manager new project um like you know things aren't perfect but but i'm seeing a philosophy i'm seeing a direction i'm seeing a buy-in from the team that's really exciting uh and you're seeing young guys now also like keep up with the old guys like 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 um like like uh albert gundinson and 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 um uh, uh Stroitman, like the, the old guard so there's a nice mix in the team so so i think that this is actually a game that that it's going to be a, a hard one i actually think that that it might be an entertaining one for the neutral as much as i hate that that term um but i'm going to be on the seat of uh the edge of my seat the whole time because like we we, we need this and, and i'm not i don't you know, I'm not secure until until the season is over, and I know we're not going down to B because as, as fun as it is, and no matter where they go, like we're supporting. Um, in this day and age, like financially, it makes it so much easier to operate as a club and and to and to plan for longevity as a club and to continue for another 130 years as a club uh, if we're in A and if we're making money and like you know maybe seven 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 partners can actually like uh, do something that that idiot Preziozzi going to do and, and like get us into Europa League or, or even the Conference League because every one of those is like an increase in, in, in funding uh, and, and, and that helps us buy, you know, better players, helps us progress. There's no reason in my mind why we shouldn't have that, that star over our crest. Are you, are you uh, actually thinking about that year where we reached the Europa League yes. and we didn't and have, we were not able to get that UEFA license 
and mm -hmm. the freaking cousin, right. I'm going to call him that way, actually went. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm referencing. Yeah, for anybody uh, who, who didn't pick up on that. Um, so, uh, and there's no reason why we shouldn't be in the Champions League. We're, we're Genoa. Like, we're the oldest team in Italy. We have that history, right? Like, or it's most But that, that starts, that starts against Monza like that that trajectory starts and 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 I think every game actually this season has to be a battle and has to be like has to be hard fought every place counts now at this point so let's get into the predictions Matt mm -hmm. yeah I mean uh I think Ellie set us up really well for this one it's it's a really important match it's it's a good one that it's coming back at home obviously somewhat limited with Vasquez suspended with the second with the yellow card band that he picked up towards the end of the the match against Inter I think he gets a little bit of a pass with the wonder goal that he scored. Sorry to spoil that for you, Ellie, but I'm sure you knew it. Anyway. Yeah, um, no, no, I saw the highlights. Yeah, it's just amazing. Um, I don't know, man. I mean, it, it's tough. This is uh, a, a team that I think we maybe can match up in some ways well against. Um, I'm, I'm curious, again, how... I don't think we're going to see any major formation changes from Gila. Maybe some personnel swaps or something along the sort. Obviously, we need to make a change for Vasquez. <laughs> Um, but it's, I always feel like a little bit pessimistic going into matches like this for the same reason that, you know, it's a coin flip. I believe in the boys. I believe in Gila. I believe in our way, but there's, these matches aren't gimmies. They're not just like matches that you take away. You look at some of the kind of underlying stuff, you know, the, the Monza have kind of had this strange run of form recently. They beat Salernitana, which kind of is like saying they woke up in the morning like that seems to happen to everybody <laughs> at four slurs yeah. events. but they also beat milan after milan also were down a man early into the second half and they got totally crushed by uh roma i think most recently so like it's kind of okay what's going to go on here um i look at their their keeper de gregorio i think has the most saves per match of any keeper in the whole league which is kind of interesting and their goal scoring rates are around the same as us they're around like a goal a match so like how does this thing end i don't know um, I, I do like in my gut, I'm kind of actually nervous for this match, but I, I also feel, and you saw it in the match and thought from the guys that there's, there's a type of determination within this squad, which has been there for most of the season that I think will, will manifest. I know like the intangible side of like matches is kind of flimsy, but we responded really, really well in that match, despite a fluky call and going up against one of the, you know, the basically sure file season winner this season. Um, we didn't back down. We didn't had pull it in. We still tried to get a point. We almost did, by the way. It, it had uh, Bettina had not been a little bit boneheaded with a couple of his chances. I think we probably would have had still something out of that match. And I mean, to be fair to him, he's not had a whole lot of time for us. So. The chemistry is not quite there yet, which is fine. It's, you expect that. So I, I feel like this could be a, an important win for us. I, I still I don't know why I have such nerves for this match, but I do. And I, I, I kind of feel more comfortable saying it's going to end in a draw. Um, there's just something on both sides that's kind of pushing and pulling me within where the match is going to end up. Um, it's, I'm calling it a draw, but I think underneath I'm feeling a little bit more confident than that. I just, there's some angst around this. There shouldn't be an angst in a mid table clash like this, but for me, there kind of is. I think it will be 1 1. Um, I think you'll see Goodmanson on the score sheet, um, but I, I think it'll be a match well played by the boys. Yeah. Yeah. I, I You put it so, so eloquently. Uh, I feel very similarly, actually. It's like it's like one of those games where it's like uh, part of me thinks we might like scratch out like a scrappy two one win, yeah. or or we might have like like a last minute goal scored on us or in, the, in stoppage time. Like it sort of feels like like the it, it could go either way, um, which is why like you know uh, maybe 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 it, it, it's a bit of. Uh, of a, of a hope that you know i'm hoping for a, a draw so that maybe i can be pleasantly surprised but but not heartbroken if we lose um but it, it, it's like you shouldn't it, there, there actually should be angst around these games because as matt said because if we can't beat monzo which is like our, our like closest direct competitor yeah. then 
you know, it sort of it shows where we are in the project, and and you know, yeah. my grandiose dreams of, of of winning another Scudetto eventually is, is is maybe a little too far flung. Look, but that's why these you should be anxious about these games. No, I'm I'm with Ellie so much. I'm so glad to hear you feeling the same way because like you and Fabri and I were messaging. I can't remember if it was before the match on Monday or or if it was afterwards, but we were talking about Bologna and like where they're on the table right now, and it's like we could be Bologna. Like, we could totally be where they are, and we can be past where they are. Like, when you look at even some of the core players that we have, and, you know, obviously we've moved on to Drag Machine already, but, like, you look at some of the guys in the squad and the development that's been happening, you look at the Genoa for a long time has had a reputation of being just this incredible experience. Like, guys like Tiago Mota and others would say how amazing, I mean, I guess maybe interesting in bringing him up in that instance but saying how amazing the fan support was Hernan Crespo I think said similar stuff even coming back to Chelsea afterwards like these guys were so amazing it was a different level so you have development you have atmosphere you have uh, opportunity and in in concept that can really work for us and we're seeing other teams have success so it's it puts more pressure in some ways on games like this because it's not like in seasons past where we just, every match is a precious point and we just need a precious point and we just need to stay in. Like there's an idea that feels more and more at risk the less that you're able to win matches like this, which is I think why is it, it becomes a little bit nervy. So. Yeah, and it started to slip, it's, it, there was like a recidivism, uh, there was like a long backslide of games just like that, just like us, like, yeah. You know, not showing up for uh, like there were a couple of times where we like I think we beat Juventus or like we beat Roma unexpectedly, but then we we would lose to to Frosinone or something, right. right? Like and it's like well hell, so so yeah, like and 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 I think for any fan, long suffering fan, like if we lose a game like this, it's sort of like there's a little bit of of that PTSD of like oh no, here we go again, right? Like. Um, and so, and for the sake of, of, of the, the, the fans' blood pressure and, and mental state, like, we need to win this game. But that not that just football in general? Yeah, yeah. And I'm actually going to go a little, sorry, I'm, I'm actually going to go a little bit different. So I'm going to start by saying I want to bring back this feudalism, meaning I, I wasn't there, obviously, but 1920. 526 I'm not if I'm not mistaken is the year of the scudetto of the guns they called it it's like a scudetto delle pistole where we lost the scudetto because in the days of the fascist era uh, that's when Bologna actually was crowned uh, for, for that scudetto which was our tent that was the star and since then we're, we haven't gotten anything of course but that's on the Bologna remark now, when it comes to, to Monza, I think you're right. Like when you say that this is the, the team that if you really, if you think about it, this was like what, 10 matches ago, it was uh, sometime in December, we were tying uh, 0-0 in Monza. Uh, Monza still remembering the, what, what they were last year, meaning the surprise, right? And I think that indirectly, it's not as obvious as they were last year we are the surprise we are some could claim that it's bologna but i personally think genoa is is a surprise because all what monza is doing is 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 staying at the same level bologna has been building up up until now even though it is a pleasant surprise not to see the typical six sisters uh but at the same time this is the team that we should have probably won in the first half first leg but we just didn't have the power, perhaps. I can't remember now the details of who was playing, who was not. A lot of injuries. December, December's a tough time of year. It's a crowded schedule. It's t- It's cold. Everybody's tired. Like it's, it's, Teams do weird things in December. Then, no, you're right. And perhaps we had a lot of players that were missing. Still, this was just before the, the transfer market. I remember with Matt, we were yeah. saying, can't wait for the transfer market to get some support because our bench is short because Retegi was out for, for two months. It, you know, a long story. And that freaking usual, one of the seven uh, goals that we conceded in the dying minutes of, of the match. Oh, man. So yeah. I call it revenge. And I call it not only a sketch. You 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 thought it, could, it will be sketchy or nervy. I think it's going to be a clean win. 
not only because of a revenge from the first leg, but also to show how um, the in undeserved was the win against Inter Milan and to, sh to put a footprint towards that, you know, staying up above in Serie A, we're probably not going to reach Europa, which is okay because we need to do one step at a time. Mm -hmm. But we still want to, as Goodmanson said, after the transfer market in January, let's go for the top 10. And top 10 means let's get Monza, let's get Torino, and let's get up there. By the way, so Toro from your, played from your mouth God's ears. I'm, yeah. I, I'm calling a clean 2 nothing. Oh, please. Please, <laughs> yeah, like uh, just and and do it early. Like let's yeah. let's do it. Let's do the business in the first half, so that I like I don't have to sit there in angst for for ninety minutes. That's plus. part of the passion. That's part of the passion. That's what builds up the happiness. Yeah, that's the after your help. That's that's one hundred percent. No, yeah. but like I'm I'm getting triple loaded right now as well. So I'm in the midst of the Tottenham season, and, and th this is Tottenham. Like Tottenham is like we're a team that's going to give up a goal in the last minute, or we're going to score three in the last seven minutes of the game, and 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 win that way. It's very stressful. And Toronto is also on like a new journey, new manager. Um, also, and like I'm I'm excited about the, the direction, but it's just like a nervy time. So like I like Saturday and Sunday, I'm watching four and a half hours of football and it's like I'm having a stroke the whole time <laughs> just give me give me an easy game please a neat, let's say a, a thoughtful but easy in my opinion anyway. yeah, yeah. I, I, also because we deserve it we deserve it similarly to Udinese where it showed the supremacy that's what I believe and that's what I want to see yeah all right yeah so I think we're at a wrap I want it we want it to in normalcy, say thank you to Ellie for being our extreme fantastic guest. Uh, to bring back memory lane uh, memories or even to understand better. And here I'm putting a quote unquote, which I know he's not going to listen to it because just how uh, we know how who he is. We had a previous guest, his name is uh, William Immobili, and he's a part of the core in, in Gradinata. To bring back and, and listen to more understanding of what all trust is all about and and we wanted to really thank you for that that was really awesome and especially for that blue check out to pezzo di mad it's like <laughs> forever <laughs> for Forever and always, Bucciarcato Pezzo di Merda. And, and yeah, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure. Like, I, I my favorite thing in the world is to, to talk football and especially to talk Genoa because everywhere I go, I, I sing the praises. And, and hopefully next winter, I'll be down at the Bombonera in Argentina with the with the, the Rosso Blue flag. You know, because uh, everywhere I go, I bring Genoa with me as, as much as I bring Toronto with me. So, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for this. For the great chat. Small parenthesis, we need to get that thing straight, like with the Bombonera. It's like even some Doria fans went there and, and they claimed it their own and so on. Enough already. <laughs> well, we, we were arguing with, uh, the presidents were arguing with each other before Santoria was even like like merged. So right. like, uh, again, it just goes to show you that they, they're sick in the head, you know, they <laughs> like, and, and there should be no stigma, but they need the care that 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 they deserve, right? So so yeah. pray for them. <laughs> but yeah, boys, take care, and uh, to all of your listeners as well. If anybody finds themselves in Toronto, reach out to me. Uh, you can find me on on Instagram. It's it's Ellie Zeldin. It's my name, and and we'll bring you to the Gradinata. You'll recognize some songs that we put to English words to, and uh, you'll you'll become a Toronto Nancy's uh, the same way that that I became a Genoano. That's awesome. Thank you very much again, Ellie, and never forget everybody. Luce Cato, Pazzo di Merda. Always and forever. Genoano. Ciao, guys. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. You've listened to La Lanterna, a spotlight on Italian football, a podcast powered by Genoani Siresta. Thank you for listening and see you next week. 